One of the more cryptic parts of FNAF, the happiest day minigames from FNAF 3, have been mostly understood for a while. Charlotte, with the possible assistance of other souls, is giving cake to various crying children throughout these arcade minigames, all in the hopes that they can finally move on. Fairly straightforward. On the crying child's page in the encyclopedia, he is not listed as appearing in FNAF 3. Wait, no, 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 no. That has to be a misprint because... But, but no, that... That can't and be. That, that's not. Oh, but, but, but what about no? That's not. Just what? What about? about we could kid, do the. Huh. All right, slices. Put on your aprons. We need to make ourselves a theory here. First, let's gather our ingredients. We got to reevaluate everything we know about Happiest Day, so let's take it from the top. Right away, you have access to most of the mini games, but they're hidden and there isn't much to do in them. To make any progress, you need to break out of BB's Air Adventure, go past these Shadow Balloon Boys, and collect this rainbow glowing balloon. Once you've done that, in Mangle's Quest, you can break out, go past this Shadow Puppet, climb the balloons, and collect a piece of cake. Once you've done that, we're in business. In BB's Air Adventure, Chica's Party, Stage 01, and RXQ's level, you glitch out of bounds, find a crying child, Child, give them a piece of cake. If you do all of this and access the Happiest Day minigame, we see a spirit with a puppet mask walk by several children celebrating with odd masks. At the end of the room, you'll see four crying children, all with a different FNAF 1 animatronic mask and one crying child on the right. We place a cake on the table, the crying child puts on presumably a Golden Freddy mask, the masks fall, and the balloons float up to the ceiling. Now, for a while, we all assumed that this meant all of these spirits moved on. After all, the masks fall and the balloons float up into the air. That's pretty clear symbolism, but the book notes that Charlie can sense Afton is still around and chooses to stay, so we can't assume any of them left here. So we know at least that Charlie stays, which leads me to believe that the happiest day has already happened in the timeline, at least before FNAF 6, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's mix our ingredients and see what kind of theories start to form. Okay, test one. It's strange. It's not contacting anything. It's showing a map? Uh, if it's going to show me a map, maybe I can find a way out of here. I know there was one. Well, I guess we'll do that then. Wait a minute. Is that what I... Well, look at that. A sponsor. Oh, I can always use more supplies. <clears throat> Today's video is brought to you by Morgan & Morgan Injury Law Firm. Injured and don't know where to start? With Morgan & Morgan, it's so easy. Because Morgan & Morgan has modernized the injury law process. You can submit your case details, sign contracts, and pictures, all from your phone. You can even text your legal team. And yes, I said legal team. Because with Morgan & Morgan, you don't just get a lawyer. You get a whole legal team to assist you with your case. And in eight clicks or less, you can submit a claim with Morgan & Morgan. That's right, you don't need to visit a law office or go through a stuffy consultation. With Morgan & Morgan, you can submit a claim without ever leaving the couch. When you get into a car accident, seeking representation should be one of the first things you do. Now, it is one of the first. Obviously, the first one is to make sure that you and the other person are okay. Then, call the police for a police report, contact your insurance, and then seek legal counsel. And with a Morgan & Morgan, it couldn't be easier. Especially because their fee is free. There's no sign-up fees, no upfront costs, or anything like that. In fact, you don't even pay unless you win. All the calls, meetings, texts, and all of that is completely free of charge. Which is astounding when you consider the value, because they are America's largest injury law firm. So if you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. You can submit a claim in 8 clicks or less without ever leaving your couch. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash rytoast or click the link in the description. Or dial pound law, that's pound 529, from your cell phone. Thanks again to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring today's video. Morgan & Morgan, for the people. Ooh. A key. Interesting. If I've got a map and a key. I think we're in business. Straight away, one of the biggest points that makes me want to revisit these games are these two characters receiving real canon names. Shadow Balloon Boy and Shadow Puppet in the character encyclopedia. And before anyone gets up in arms here, I'm not making a whole theory just based on this book. I recognize that there are some issues with it. But I do want to point out that I think this book is most useful in figuring out what we should look at next. Essentially, taking a look at this, and whenever it makes us question something, just double check, see if there's something we missed. And that's what I'm doing in today's video. In this case, I think the book is telling us, hey, double check Happiest Day. Do you really know what's going on? 
it names two previously unnamed set pieces and points out that maybe some people could stay after the balloon moving on scene. So back to these guys. Actually, one more. This book mentions these two by name, so I think we can officially name this thing Shadow Cupcake. It appears in Chica's party, and I mean, if these two guys get a name, why not Cupcake? Immediately, this naming convention jumps to the front of my mind, because there's only one other character in the franchise with a naming convention of Shadow, Shadow Freddy. This figure in the actual world of FNAF who I speculate to be the agony-fueled reflection of Cassidy. Regardless, Shadow Freddy can often be seen paired with RWQ, as they're both mysterious, very rare creatures with a similar visual design. I mean, RWQ is part of the Happiest Day minigame. Why is this important? Well, between RWQ's appearance and special delivery and the direct callout of Dark Remnant in the character encyclopedia, I think it's pretty safe to assume that RWQ is a creature made of Dark Remnant, the game timeline equivalent to Agony from the books. This is bolstered from the parallels we see in the story Hide and Seek from the Fazbear Frights novels. What is Dark Remnant? We'll get into that, trust me, but stick with me for a second. If RWQ and Shadow Freddy are so similar, and we suspect that RWQ is made of Dark Remnant, then we could also speculate that Shadow Freddy is the same. All this to say, it's possible that the term Shadow and this visual design denotes a creature made of Dark Remnant, especially if those creatures exhibit similar characteristics and do similar actions to Shadow Freddy and RWQ. So I think it's safe to assume that all three of these shadow creatures from the Happiest Day minigames, and possibly the areas in which they reside, are either made up of or heavily influenced by Dark Remnant. Alright, I hear you. This is great and all right, but why should I care? These are just characters within an in-universe arcade game. Well, my question to you would be, are they? Like FNAF pointed out in his follow-up video, these 8-bit minigames have been used to show real-life things that happened, but in a gamified way. And in Sister Location, Elizabeth doesn't canonically die outside. The minigame is just meant to be metaphorical and progress the story. So if we extend that logic to these games, what do we get? Well, we'll have to break them down into representations of what they're trying to tell us. So put on your hazmat suits, we're getting very abstract and very speculative. When we, as the player, give cake to a crying child, what does that represent? What is it saying? Look at these games thematically. The main three have a brightly colored upper area above a monochrome darker area. The darker area being inhabited by these shadow creatures made of dark remnant. To me, this seems like an analogy of the conscious mind, the conscious upper thinking area and the subconscious lower area. It could even be a metaphor for an afterlife, but it's a little too loose of an interpretation. Is there anything within FNAF that we can use to anchor an idea of an afterlife, or at least any example we see within the games? Mm, yeah, two things. FNAF World and Ultimate Custom Night. Although we have no idea idea how, we're almost certain that Cassidy, or to be more correct, specifically the one you should not have killed, was able to create this hellish purgatory to torture William as long as they possibly can. So we know that for some reason, spirits in this universe can create essentially a purgatory for other spirits, or at least manipulate this otherworldly space to dwell within it. It's weird, but it's what the game presents to us. But FNAF World shows us that not only is this not special to the one you should not have killed, it's also not the only purpose to create one of these spaces. FNAF World tells us that it's a special place, but something outside has affected the inside, and now we as the player have to leave breadcrumbs to help someone move on. In it, we travel through this bright colorful world and occasionally dip down into this monochrome darker area. Not only does this nearly match one to one with Happiest Day from FNAF 3, but the things you do in this monochrome world directly reference the way you access the Happiest Day minigames within FNAF 3. Now, this isn't the first time that I've drawn this parallel, but in hindsight, I think my last interpretation was wrong. Previously, I speculated that FNAF World and FNAF 3's Happiest Day are two ways of telling the same story. In essence, it was just a retelling on how Charlotte helps the crying child to move on. But there's two problems with this. First, if FNAF World is just a retelling of helping the crying child to move on, what about the other four kids? And second, the character encyclopedia doesn't even say the crying child exists in FNAF 3. So why are these two games connected? Well, I think it's because it's showing us what Charlotte does to help souls move on, because she does this not only in The Happiest Day, 
but again in FNAF world. We've been in the thick of the astrophysical talk for a bit now, so let's try to anchor ourselves back to something physical in FNAF. Try to bring in some evidence so we don't lose ourselves here. Remnant is a bit of a hot button topic within FNAF, but for the most part, a good chunk of the community can agree that it has something to do with the soul. And in the ultimate guidebook, we get a bit more information about this elusive substance. Quote, if remnant is a conductor of emotion, it's possible that bright remnant forms from positive emotions, while shadowy remnant is formed from negative ones. Shout out DJ Aiden slash convenient lamp for that picture. Okay, that tracks with what we know about shadow animatronics so far, but we're still missing something. Go back to Ultimate Custom Night. We know that the one you should not have killed is creating this purgatory to torture William, but how exactly are they doing that? We get hints to it via some death quotes in the game. I am remade, but not by you by the one you should not have killed. These are things that Afton created, creations of his own mind, things that the one you should not have killed shouldn't know about. Somehow, the one you should not have killed is using the memory of things that they themselves were not there for to torture William with. Things only William would know about. Does this mean that the one you should not have killed is using William's memories against him? Okay, we're starting to get somewhere. We've established that it is possible in this franchise for a spirit to A, seek out the memory of another spirit, B, manipulate or even create little pockets of the space in between life and death, and C, that remnant can exist in two halves, light remnant and dark remnant, positive and negative. Now we look back to Happiest Day. Now these abstract representations can be given weight. What do all these mini games have in common? There's scenes of a fun day at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, and in each of these, we find a monochrome child crying, and we give them a colorful piece of cake, a happy memory, and it's then that they open their eyes. I think we've nearly cracked this thing. The only question left really is, who are these kids? Realistically, we have two options. It's either the missing child incident victims or the dead child incident victims. So personally, I'm a believer of Molten MCI. Essentially, the missing children incident souls were used to fuel the Funtime animatronics during experiments. The Funtime animatronics then form into Ennard, Ennard splits off into Scrap Baby and Molten Freddy, and now all the missing child souls reside within Molten Freddy. The problem with this theory is no one really agrees on how the missing child incident kids end up in the fun times. I went into this at the end of my last video, so I'm not going to go too far into it right now. But essentially, my idea is that since FNAF 2 really establishes that pieces of the original animatronics are used to create and repair the toy animatronics, Animatronics. In doing that, part of the soul of the missing child incident kids ends up in the toy animatronics. Then, in the end of FNAF 2, when we hear that the toys are scrapped, William just goes dumpster diving for some remnant, bada bing bada boom, soul energy in the fun times. But, part of the soul is left in the originals. That's how the missing child incident kids can essentially be in two places at once. Half remained in the withered animatronics, and half were in the toys. This is also to say I don't think the second batch of children that William murdered actually went on to possess anything. I think they just moved on. So our only option for the happiest day are the missing child incident kids, right? Well, literally half right. As we know, the Funtime experiments didn't work as intended. This is why I think the Follow Me minigames happens. William realizes he needs more of the pieces of the souls that he's experimenting on. He goes back for the FNAF 1 animatronics. But remember, the puppet guided the souls into these suits to give them life. This is all they've known for years. When they were dismantled, they were left with nothing. To quote Henry, And he robbed them of the only thing that they had, again. They were possibly left in a terrible state, lost and confused. I think during this process is when the happiest day happens. All right, I think we've got it. Let's pop our mixture into the oven and see what kind of horrors rise. William needs more remnant to continue his experiments. The excess soul he gained from the scrapped toy animatronics wasn't sufficient. But lucky for him, a Freddy Fazbear pizza using the original animatronics had just closed down. All he had to do was break in and dismantle them. And so he did. One by one, he lured the animatronics to the safe room that he knew they couldn't enter. And once they started glitching out, he pounced, taking them apart one by one. But what happened to the soul inside? What happens to what little consciousness you have left if you're suddenly ripped apart? These children, these victims, they fell into themselves. With all access to the outside world removed, they were lost inside, stuck 
in their worst memories, reliving their last moments, surrounded by their darkest emotions. In one order of events, it ends there. Afton gets his remnant and leaves. But that's not how the story goes. Charlotte noticed this was happening again, and just like before, she would give life to those lost spirits. This time, instead of bringing them into physical form inside of the suits, she had to try another strategy, bringing them back to themselves with a happy memory. A memory of cake, of celebration, of their happiest day. Only by doing that is she able to salvage what's left of their lost souls. And once she had done it for all five of them, they were not only able to leave the suits, but the pizzeria and move on. Of course, not before some well-due revenge, but just to be sure that he stayed down, Charlotte and the soul possessing Golden Freddy stayed behind. I know that sounds a little fanfiction-y, but I think this is what Happiest Day is trying to represent. After all, this ending doesn't happen unless you achieve the Happiest Day. And why would this be any less possible than Charlotte literally using arcade games to achieve it? This has to be a link in some way, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. If you have a better idea for Happiest Day, leave it in the comments. Or if it's long, I suggest going to the Raito subreddit and posting it there. But if you want more information on Shadow Freddy and RWQ, go ahead and check out that video I made covering the entire topic. It gets pretty weird. For now, a huge shout out to the best patrons, The Toasted Slices, Emberisk, Charlie Bean, Lovey Puppy, Stormachow, Just BKZ, Chickpea, Lola Fembo, The Viper 26, Lehan, James Reiner, Emily De La Sierra, INGD, Givo, Snowblossom, Nika, Raven Eris, Angel, Glamrock Bonnie is an Agani, Dionysus, Bucky Ray, Mariah R, Raz Van Rooks, Luce, and Mystic Angel. And until next time, as always, Stay toasty slices.